Chapter 23 of Hopalong Cassidy's Roundup. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Peterson. Hopalong Cassidy's Roundup by Clarence Edward Mulford. Chapter 23. The work of separating the cattle into herds of different brands was not a big contract and with so many men it took but a comparatively short time, and in two days all signs of the rustlers had faded. It was then that good news went the rounds, and the men looked forward to a week of pleasure, which was all the sharper accentuated by the grim mercilessness of the expedition into the panhandle. Here was a chance for unlimited hilarity, and a whole week in which to give strict attention to celebrating the recent victory. So one day— Mr. Hopalong Cassidy rode rapidly over the plain, thinking about the joys and excitement promised by the carnival to be held at Muddy Wells. With that rivalry so common to western towns, the inhabitants maintained that the carnival was to break all records, this because it was to be held in their town. Perry's Bend and Buckskin had each promoted a similar affair, and if this year's festivities were to be an improvement on those which had gone before, they would most certainly be worth riding miles to see. Perry's Bend had been unfortunate in being the first to hold a carnival, inasmuch as it only set a mark to be improved upon, and Buckskin had taken advantage of this and had added a brass band, and now in turn was to be eclipsed. The events slated were numerous and varied, and most important being those which dealt directly with the everyday occupations of the inhabitants of that section of the country. Bronco busting, steer roping and tying, rifle and revolver shooting, trick riding and fancy roping made up the main features of the program and were to be set off by horse and foot racing and other county fair necessities. Altogether, the proud citizens of the town looked forward with keen anticipation to the coming excitements and were prone to swagger a bit and rub their hands in condescending egoism while the crowded gambling halls and saloons and the three-card Monty men on the street corners enriched themselves at the cost of venturesome know-it-alls. Hopalong was firmly convinced that his day of hard riding was well worthwhile, for the Bar 20 was to be represented in strength. Probably a clearer insight into the idea of a carnival can be gained by his definition, grouchily expressed to Red Connors in the day following the last affair. Raise cane? Go broke? wake up and begin punching cows all over again. But that was the day after, and the day after is always filled with remorse. Hopalong and Red, having twice in succession won the revolver and rifle competitions respectively, hoped to make it three straight. Lanky Smith, the Bar 20 rope expert, had taken the first prize in the only contest he had entered. Skinny Thompson had lost and drawn with Lefty Allen of the O Bar O in the bronco-busting event, but as Skinny had improved greatly in the interval, his friends confidently expected him to yank first place for the honor of his ranch. These expectations were backed on all the available Bar 20 money, and if they were not realized, something of a nature of a calamity would swoop down upon and wrap that ranch in gloom. Since the O Bar O was aggressively optimistic, the betting was at even money, hats and guns and the losers would begin life anew so far as earthly possessions were concerned. No other competitors were considered in this event, as Skinny and Lefty had so far outclassed all others that the honor was believed to lie between these two. Hopalong, blissfully figuring out the chances of the different contestants, galloped around a clump of mesquite only fifteen miles from Muddy Wells and stiffened in his saddle. For twenty rods ahead of him, on the trail, was a woman. As she heard him approach, she turned and waited for him to overtake her, and when she smiled, he raised his sombrero and bowed. "'Will you please tell me where I am?' she asked. "'You are fifteen miles southeast of Muddy Wells,' he replied. "'But which is southeast?' "'Right behind you,' he answered. "'The town lies right ahead.' "'Are you going there?' she asked. "'Yes, ma'am.' "'Then you will not care if I ride with you?' she asked. "'I'm a trifle frightened.' Why, I'd be pleased if you do, though there ain't nothing out here to be afraid of now. I had no intention of getting lost, she assured him, but I dismounted to pick flowers and cactus leaves, and after a while I had no conception of where I was. How is it you are out here? he asked. You shouldn't get so far from town. Why, Papa is an invalid and doesn't like to leave his room, and the town is so dull. 
although the carnival is waking it up somewhat. Having nothing to do, I procured a horse and determined to explore the country. Why, this is like Stanley and Livingstone, isn't it? You rescued the explorer. And she laughed heartily. He wondered who in thunder Stanley and Livingstone were, but said nothing. I like the West. It's so big and free, she continued. But it is very monotonous at times, especially when compared with New York. Papa swears dreadfully at the hotel and declares the food will drive him insane. But I notice that he eats much more heartily than he did when he was in the city. And the service, it is awful. But when one leaves the town behind, it is splendid. And I can appreciate it because I had such a hard season in the city last winter, so many balls, parties, and theaters, that I simply wore myself out. I never hankered much for them things, Hopalong replied. And I don't like the towns much either. Once or twice a year, I gets as far as Kansas City, but I soon tires of it and hits the back trail. You see, I don't like fence country. I want lots of room and air. She regarded him intently. I know that you will think me very forward. He smiled and slowly replied, I think you are all okay. There do not appear to be many women in this country, she suggested. No, there ain't many, he replied, thinking of the kind to be found in all the cow towns. They don't seem to hanker for this kind of life. They wants parties and lots of dancing and them kind of things. I reckon there ain't a whole lot to tempt them to come. You evidently regard women as being very frivolous, she replied. Well, I'm speaking from there not being any out here, he responded. Although I don't know much about them, to tell you the truth, them what are out here can't be counted. Then he flushed and looked away. She ignored the remark and placed her hand to her hair. Goodness, my hair must look terrible. He turned and looked. Your hair is pretty. I always did like brown hair. She laughed and put back the straggling locks. It is terrible. Just look at it. Isn't it awful? Why, no, I reckons not, he replied critically. It looks sort of free and easy that away. Well, it's no matter. It can't be helped, she laughed. Let's race, she cried, and was off like a shot. He humored her, until he saw that her mount was getting unmanageable, when he quietly overtook her and closed her pony's nostrils with his hands, the operation having a most gratifying effect. Joe had not or let you had this cayuse, he said. Why, how do you know of whom I procured it? she asked. By the brand. It's a O bar O cancelled with J H over it. He buys all of his cayuses from the O bar O. She found out his name, and after an interval of silence, she turned to him with eyes full of inquiry. What is that thorny shrub just ahead? she asked. That's mesquite, he replied eagerly. Tell me all about it, she commanded. Why, there ain't much to tell, he replied. Only it's a valuable tree out here. The Apaches use it a whole lot of ways. They get honey from the blossoms and glue and gum, and they use the bark for tan and hide. The dried pods and leaves are used to feed their cattle, and the wood makes corrals to keep them in. They use the wood for making other things, too. And it is of two colors. A sap makes a dye that won't wash out, and the beans make a bread that won't get sour or get hard. Then it makes a barrier that sure is a dandy. Coyotes and men can't get through it, and it protects a whole lot of birds and things. The snakes hate it like poison, for the thorns get under their scales and whoops things up for them. It keeps the sand from shifting, too. Down south, where there's plenty of water, it often grows forty feet high, but up here it squats close to the ground so it can save the moisture. In the night, the temperature sometimes falls thirty degrees, and that helps it, too. How can it live without water? she asked. It gets all the water at once, he replied, smiling. The tap roots go straight down till they find it, sometimes fifty feet. That's why it don't shrivel up in the sun. Then there are a lot of little roots right under it, and they protect the tap roots. The shade it gives is the coolest out here, for the leaves turn with the wind and lets the breeze through. They're hung on little stems. How splendid, she exclaimed. Oh, look there, she cried, pointing ahead of them. A chaparral cock strutted from its decapitated enemy, a rattlesnake and disappeared in the chaparral. Hopalong laughed. Mr. Scissors Bill Roadrunner has great fun with snakes. He runs along the sand, and he can run, too. When he sees a snake taking a siesta, snip goes his bill, and the snake slides over the divide. 
Our fighting friend may stop some coyote's appetite before morning, though, unless he stays where he is. Just then, the gray wolf blundered in sight a few rods ahead of them, and Hopalong fired instantly. His companion shrunk from him and looked at him reproachfully. Why did you do that? she demanded. Why, because they cost us big money every year, he replied. There's a bounty on them, because they pull down calves and sometimes full-grown cows. I'm sure wondering why he got so close. They're usually just out of range where they stays. Promise me that you will shoot no more while I'm with you. Why, sure. Didn't think you'd care, he replied. You are like that sky pilot over to La Crucius. He preached again killing things, which is all right for him, who didn't have no cows. Do you go to the missions, she asked. He replied that he did, sometimes, but forgot to add that it was usually for the purpose of hilarity, for he regarded sky pilots with humorous toleration. Tell me about yourself. What do you do for enjoyment? And all about your work, she requested. He explained in minute detail the art of punching cows, and told her more of the West in half an hour than she could have learned from a year's experience. She showed such a keen interest in his words that it was a pleasure to talk to her, and he monopolized the conversation until the town intruded its sprawling collection of unpainted shacks and adobe huts in their field of vision. End of chapter 23